gentlemen, we'll call this meeting of the Planning Commission to order. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. If you would please turn off your cell phones. If you need to take a call, take it outside. Uh, if you're here to speak on a topic, when the public hearing opens, I'll invite you up and you will have two minutes to speak. You need to introduce yourself into the microphone for the public record. And let's be considerate of everybody else in the room and hold your personal comments until you get a chance to speak at the microphone. Uh, with that, let's move on. The first order of business would be approval of the minutes for last meeting on August 14th. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Weston. A second? Awesome. Thank you, Brenda. Matt? Yes. Thank you. Weston? Yes. Sarah? Abstain. <laughs> Carolyn? Abstain. Brenda? Yes. Thank you. The minutes are approved. The chair has nothing to report. Does the vice chair? Nothing. Thank you. Director's office? Uh, nothing to report. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll move on to the, f the first item that's the second item on the agenda, the zoning map amendment at approximately 1790 West Associated Avenue. Sarah. Thank you, as you stated, this is a proposal to rezone two parcels at 1760 and 1790 West Associated Avenue. The proposal is to rezone the property from CC or corridor commercial. Sarah, can you pull the mic a little bit closer? Sure. Thanks. Can you hear me now? Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, I, I think you still need to be a little closer. A little closer. Let me move it yeah. over. Just move here. it over there. Yeah, there you go. So the proposal is to rezone it to light manufacturing. And the purpose of the rezoning is um, to allow for an anticipated expansion of the existing manufacturing use on the site. Um, to provide a little bit of context, um, the site is located just west of Redwood Road. You can see it outlined in green on this map, and it's located on the north side of Associated Avenue. And then more broadly, it's shown um, in, in blue on this map, and you can see that it's north of SR201 and that it's east of um, I215. So the existing zoning is corridor commercial. The properties surrounding it, the properties to the west are M1. To the south is a parcel that's owned public lands. It's a post office facility. And then to the east and the north is also corridor commercial. There are a few photographs of the site. And so as part of this proposal, we review whether the proposal to rezone is compatible with the master plan. And in this particular case, the proposal is compatible with Plan Salt Lake. It's compatible with several policies that are in the economy section of the plan. And it's also compatible with the West Side Master Plan. The West Side Master Plan recommends that about 100 feet of commercial zoning um, is located on the west side of Redwood Road. And so with the proposed rezoning, about two, a little over 200 feet would remain with that commercial zoning. And then this would be to the west of that. And for the areas west of that, it encourages business or industrial park, industrial park district in that area. And so that's consistent with the proposed rezoning. As far as the existing zoning limitations, the applicant has occupied the site since 1965. And the industrial zoning was on the site until 1995. And um, at the, in 1995, there was a rezoning that affected a large number of properties that did not necessarily look at the uses on the ground in the area. And so the existing commercial zoning limits expansion of the existing manufacturing use that's on the site. And so the rezone would allow for the expansion of that use and the property would become conforming. So based on this information, planning staff recommends that the planning commission forward a recommendation of approval to the city council. Are there questions Thanks, for Sarah? Thanks, Sarah. Any questions for Sarah? No, is the applicant here? Applicants here. Have them come up and
you'll have state your name for the record and you'll have 10 minutes to tell us why you want to do this uh, richard reese i'm the president of standard plumbing supply company and our family has owned this property since the mid to early 60s and uh, we would appreciate the support of the planning commission in approval of our rezone uh, some things have happened over the property when uh, it was originally, let's call it up zoned or whatever it might call, change of zoning 1995, it was all owned under one parcel. And so the division of the parcels, which has happened within the last uh, 10 years, is allowing us to keep the uh, property on Redwood Road in line with the commercial corridor requirement, while the property in the rear that has always been used for manufacturing to uh, be able to continue not only just a grandfathered um, status uh, from an existing use, but now we can be legal conforming and it will give us an opportunity to seek permits for expansion in the future. So we would appreciate your support. I think that it fits the zoning requirements as outlined by the city. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, go ahead and step back. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing on this item. Is there anyone from a community council who wishes to speak on this item? Is there anyone from the public who would like to come up and speak on this item? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, do we need staff to come back up? Anyone you want to talk to the applicant again? I'd like to make a motion. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Thanks, Brenda. <clears throat> um, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment, a map amendment file PLN PCM 2019-00540. <coughs> Proposed zone change from CC, Quarter Commercial District, to M1, Light Manufacturing District, in order to allow for an expansion of the existing manufacturing <coughs> use on site, which is non-conforming with the current zoning. I'll, I'll second that. Wow, that was a... <laughs> Carolyn? Any other discussion? No? Matt? Yes. Weston? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Carolyn? Agree. Brenda? Yes. Okay, you've got your approval from the Planning Commission. Okay, we'll move on to item number three, zoning map amendment at approximately 2064 North 2200 West and 2066 North 2200 West. David? Okay. Okay, as you uh, noted, uh, this is a zoning map amendment. It's for four parcels, uh, contiguous parcels, about 2.8 acres, and it's located approximately at 2200 west and then 2064 north, so it's um, right adjacent to Highway 215. Um, again, the applicant is uh, requesting to change from the AG2, the agricultural zone, to the M1 light manufacturing zone. Um, and stated reason was to accommodate future development of the property. We're not looking at a specific site development proposal at this time. Uh, locational context, it was in your packet for the benefit of the audience. It's kind of to the northwest of the airport, um, roughly, and it's uh, kind of near city limits. Uh, a little bit north of there, it becomes Salt Lake County property and then eventually Davis County. Um, a little more zoomed in view, it's bounded by 2100 North and 215. Uh, the direct access is through an easement that goes to 2200 West, so it doesn't have direct access to 2100 North. Uh, and it is within the Inland Port overlay boundaries. Uh, surrounding properties are zoned M1 to the south, 
There is some, uh, there is agricultural adjacent to the west, although that property has applied for a rezone and has been moved to council with a positive recommendation from the planning commission. So currently it borders on a G2 property, but that could change. Uh, across the road, north of 2100 North, it's BP business park zoning. And to the west of 2200 West, you get the airport zoning. Uh, considerations and staff analysis in the report, we looked at the nature of the general area. Um, again, that the, the general area is changing. Um, there have been a number of recent AG to M1 or BP changes. Um, looked at also uh, the master plan recommendations, although it's not strictly in line with the master plan, the master plan did recognize the future need for retail type and business type services in the area, which wouldn't necessarily be accommodated under the BP zoning. So there's a, a number of with staff felt that generally it met the master plan intention of the North Point small area master plan. Um, the inland port overlay regulations, although the property is zoned AG2, since it's within the inland port boundary overlay, they can do all uses that are allowed in the M1 zone already. It's just a matter of if the use is not allowed in the AG zone, but is allowed in the M1 zone, it would have to go through a conditional use process. So as far as the implications, it, it, the change in zoning would have little impact on future development of the property since those M1 uses could already be accommodated under the uh, current zoning. It's just a matter of what process would they go through for a site development plan. Um, there are some different buffer yard uh, requirements that increase if the M1, pro if an M1 property borders on agricultural zoned. So as far as setbacks with the neighboring property, it, it depends on if that neighboring property is rezoned or not. And, and staff is recommending that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to City Council for the requested zoning map amendment. Questions for David? So uh, am I correct that, and I think you said this, but let me make sure. Um, in my understanding of the overlay zone for the, um, for the inland port, uh, Planning Commission forwarded to Council, and I think Council approved, um, a recommendation that if it's in a M2 zone, it's basically does not have to go through a review because it's conditional use. Following, is that right? Um, so the property within the conditional, within the inland port does not, if that's zoned M2 already, doesn't have to. No, sorry. So we're talking about M1, and if sorry. Um, yeah. if the use is allowed in M1 and the AG zone, it would just be allowed. If okay. if it if it stayed AG and there was a use that they want that the property owner wanted to pursue that was allowed in the M1 zone right. that wasn't listed as a use in the AG zone, yeah. they could still pursue that M1 use. It just would have to go through the conditional use process. Right, and the conditional use process for the inland port is different than the condition, normal conditional use. Is that correct? Because it has different criteria and different requirements, or that's that's just part of condition use anyway. Um, no, they they go through our process. Uh, if there's an appeal, that's when we right. end up dealing with uh, the Inland Port Appeal Board. But they haven't established their own. Th there's no uh, different set of land use uh, regulations per se. There are guidelines. There is a provision that indicates that we're supposed to allow light manufacturing and right. in the inland port jurisdictional lands. Um, but yeah, I, there's they go through our process. It's when somebody's unhappy, then they can they can appeal go to through the, the state, board. and then there's there's this appeal process. And one of the standards is that it has to comply with. They wouldn't have to go through a conditional use process if they were M1. Correct. Well, d depending, M1 does have a variety of uses that are permitted, and it does have a variety of uses that are conditional use. So if it was a conditional use in the M1 zone, right. they would still have to follow. But the there M1. are many, there, how many uses are there for 
the agricultural zone that are not allowed in the M2 M1 zone lots I mean you've got that, that there, there are a few I think I'm trying to remember what what was in the Inland Port Act there were some that were called out specifically as not not within that light manufacturing permitted uses um, right now, I'm actually asking what about what in the okay it seems to me like this opens up the possibility of people coming in for an agricultural to rezone to M1 because M1 will be easier for them to get through under the inland port rec recommendations. It, I wouldn't say it's easier, it just changes the process they have to go through, of course. And, and again, and that's knowing but that it, conditional but the uses. is thrown more to the state, mm. can be thrown more to the state. Correct? Only under an appeal. Yeah. Right. And so the comparison of uses was uh, pages seven through, I believe, eleven in your staff report. Right. There was a chart so. that had them side by side by by which use was allowed or permitted or conditional. Is there something specific you're thinking of, Brenda? I'm sorry. Um, or, I mean, is there something specific? That well, Heather one of the one of the things that uh, happened in the inland port thing was that once we once we said something was M1, um, then the conditional uses for that, uh, then it it sort of had a pass on anything that was going to be allowed in the inland port. So you think the any conditional uses in the normal M1 get a pass because they're in the inland port? Well, they get Is that what you're thinking? a different consideration, I believe, because making it an M1 means that they're, you know, that the kinds of things that are already already part of M1 um, are compatible with theoretically compatible with the inland port guidelines. So. That would be just one of the standards that would be looked right, at in right, the conditional right. use. The other and then if we if you if you have an M one, you know, um, the con if we do a con if there is a conditional use there, uh, well, there wouldn't be very many conditional uses. Well, I was just scrolling through here. Like here's community correctional facilities are conditional. Um, um, so I, I don't think. The railroad freight terminal facilities are conditional. They remain conditional. It's the the permitted uses that are looking through the table that would you that are not in agricultural that that they can get now under a conditional use process. So you're looking at the, so we're looking at the, the permitted uses in M1. And which ones are missing from agricultural? And there's lots of those. They could pursue those. They could pursue those now through conditional through use. Conditional use through conditional process. use. Or the conditional uses that are not permitted in ag, but are permitted in the M1 could right. be. So all uses in the M1 could but be. It's the stuff that's missing in agriculture that is permitted, per, that's in agriculture that you could go through a conditional use process. That you could go through the conditional use process in the M1 zone. that clearer oh no I, I I well I knew that I'm just I'm just um, I'm trying to recall from over a year ago when we were talking about the overlay zone um, there was something about being in the M1 zone that was more of a free pass than any other zone in when, the, in when that district in, in that whole overlay over the overlay zone. And I can't remember exactly what it was, but if it were zoned M1, then there was very little that we could demand of, of, of an applicant. We were trying to figure out how we could demand things like uh, how we could ask for um, environmental impact statements and so forth that were not part of the regular, that were not part of the, um, 
that would M1. not be required, a lot of things would not be required under an M1 zone. Is that ring yeah, a bell to, with anybody? <laughs> I'm trying to remember the conversation. I mean, I'm vaguely remembering it. Um, I remember it mainly related to like freight, like so trains, trucks, and like things that had noise and moving around and where, what type of goods and services were moving through those like freight entities. Is that so if you're doing a rail, a rail freight interchange or a truck interchange, and those are permitted now, and just go to the table, all those are committed, permitted now in M1. Right. Um, so, you know, truck freight terminal, a rail, uh, you know, railroad repair, railroad freight terminal facility. Well, things that are in the M1, I think, are going to generally be allowed everywhere in the inland port. It's just what kind of conditional, what kind of conditional uh, approval process they have to go through. So this is where my memory on the inland port is failing me completely. Does the staff have anything to add to that? Do we have anybody that knows this? Hey, where's Dan where's Daniel when you need him, huh? <laughs> It's not. And again, what was ultimately adopted by the council? I mean, I think this is it. This is this this case personally is okay with me because it's a very small property, and it's already surrounded by pretty much manufacturing uses. Uh, but I would not like to see a precedent set to just any old property that's A G two in that in the inland port to come in for a, a zone change. Because I well, know that that really affects what kind of what kind of um, process they have to go through. Because in the inland port, you have to, or at least I think that's what happened. You have to have a great many more. Uh, you have to have more you know, environmental impact analysis. And and we handle those requests on a case by case basis. So yeah, we do. I think, <clears throat> but. Yeah, so it's always an argument for precedent. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, David, is your applicant here? The back. You come up and state your name for the record, and you can have 10 minutes to tell us why you want to make the zone change. Thank you, Kevin Colazzi. Um, <clears throat> I recently bought this property, and when I was looking into buying the property, I obviously I knew I was kind of landlocked with an easement, and I reached out to my neighbors who had control of the easement just to figure out what my options were long term for this property, envisioning that there's business park and menu, um, buildings going up all around, and the freeway and 2100 North, assuming that someday someone would want to buy this property from me or develop it. I began to find out if I needed second access or how wide of an access I would need. And in doing that, my neighbor to the south wanted me to go to M1 for boundary issues for his property that they're building, their buildings. If I'm changed from AG2 to M1, that allows them to be closer to my property line, which doesn't bother me. And the guy to the west is in the process of doing the same thing. So in doing that, I hired a lawyer and worked out some concessions with them, and their agreement was for me to get M1 within two years, so they would allow me to have a second access, wider access to the property, so a future buyer of the property wouldn't be those two landowners. It could be for other people as well. So that's why I'm starting. That's why I have no plan. I have nothing. You know, I bought the property and don't have the money to develop it or do anything different. Um, Plan to still have some animals on it, whatnot. Uh, yeah, and I understand people's sensitivity to the inland port and zone changes and things like that. And I wouldn't be asking for a zone change if I wasn't kind of landlocked and have to work with my two neighbors. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none, why don't you step back? 
We'll open the public hearing on this process or on this item. And is there someone from the community council that's here? Community council chair is here and she sent me a letter about five. So oh, okay. okay. <coughs> Okay, introduce yourself into the microphone and you will have five minutes. Okay, so, so the, is everybody, the community council basically has five minutes and then basically other residents have an additional two I minutes. I said you have five minutes, yeah. Okay, so uh, um, with us, I've two out of the residents have also come. With, okay, so. so you are. But, okay, so my name is Dorothy Owen. I am the chair, the chair of the okay. West Point Community Council. Um, and um, West Point, as you may know, is that is the largest community council area, and it is um, the home of the South West Point campus, the state prison, the Inland Port, and the Recreational Athletic Center. Um, and it's a very beautiful place to live. Um, I've got my comments here, so I'm gonna let those stand and that. Uh, I think there's probably a couple of things we wanna say as a community council. We have been inundated with zoning changes and land use changes and that. And as a community, we have been committed to work with developers to come up with um, kind of a model process so that each time we do this, we're not doing it over and over and reinventing it. And that it's a process that is based upon broad involvement of everybody who lives in the area, and it's based upon knowledge and facts, and underlying it, girding it, is integrity. And, and to that I want to thank Mr. Colazzi. Um, Mr. Colazzi did not have to come to the community council, and he did, and he presented, um, his, his, what he wanted to do. It was a very civil discussion and that people had different points of view. Um, but we have dealt with many other developers who have not had the same level of integrity and honesty. And no matter what happens, your neighbors know that you're an honorable man. And that's important. Um, the other thing is that um, as we go through this process, we ask your staff to identify the issues for us. And our, the major concern that residents have, and I'll let them speak for themselves later, is that the zoning process, by its nature, looks at each separate parcel in a limited way. But we are looking at multiple uh, proposals that are conflicting, and the impacts are cumulative. And so we have been repeatedly asking, not just what does this do, it just may be a small piece of property, what's the implications here? You know, it's not anything personal, it has to do what's the precedence that's being set, what's being gained, what's being lost. This is two point some acres, you can say, gee, that's not very much, it won't make any difference. But there is so little land that's agricultural in Salt Lake City. In fact, West Point house, houses almost all of the agricultural land that's left within Salt Lake. And that agricultural land is a part of the city's cultural heritage and its diversity. It's who we are. And losing any of it, um, the neighbors will tell you, could have a very much a devastating effect on what's left. So it's not just what happens to two acres, it is what is the value we have for having some agricultural land, some diversity, and respecting the impact that it has on everyone else. Um, at this point, we have had a tremendous increase in the amount of M1 land. It's almost like you can't have enough of it. And that I was unable to get the actual numbers of the increase in M1 land, but it has grown immensely. Um, and there is no more agricultural land being developed in Salt Lake City. So as you look at this, I ask, one, that you look at the values 
of the city and of the planning documents, um, but also that you don't try to second guess the inland port because you can't do it. If you think you don't understand, sometimes you have to say, maybe you don't understand because it's not understandable. Um, and we've been working on this for two years and we haven't figured it out. So what I, we have always said as a community is, we don't have to figure out what the Inland Port is doing. Our job is to make a recommendation of what is in the best interest of the community for this land and to make that recommendation to the Planning Commission. And then if it's a policy issue, to ask our elected officials to honor the values that we have as a community. And so with that, we did vote. Only residents of West Point voted. Um, if you voted, we, it was a formal vote. And uh, if you had multiple pieces of property, uh, you got one vote. If you own the property, you got one vote. And um, th the vast majority of people voted not to approve a change to M1. And thank you for thank the you. extra time. <clears throat> thank you. So my name is Denise Payne. I live at 2848 North 2200 West. Okay, you'll have two minutes. Okay. Right now, and I would love it if any one of you would take the time to come out and drive up the road on 2200 West. We are losing all of our agricultural property out there. And it's sad because the M1 that's already been built out there is bringing semis down my little two-lane road that's not even big enough for me to ride my bike, have one car coming this way and another car coming the other way. They're rattling my house. The wildlife has disappeared. We used to have a nice head, uh, herd of deer out there, and they're gone. They're all getting killed by these semis. We need to stop with all the M1 and the pollution. Take a drive out there and check out our little property. It's not a lot, but there are a lot of residents that live out there that have horses, that have kids. We want to keep it that way. There isn't hardly any left in Salt Lake. And I really would love to see any of you come out there and see what we have before you make a vote on a small piece of property because we keep giving away small pieces and we aren't going to have any left. Thank you. And yes, hi, my name is Alma Mendoza. I'm at 2240 West, <laughs> 3130 North. And uh, I have the same problem here where um, we have livestock and uh, we have a few parcels there, you know, because we just try to expand a little bit bigger and bigger. So, you know what I'm saying, with little pieces that we can buy. So this doesn't change into, you know what I'm saying, like all M1 zoning, BP. We have a problem with that. We're being invaded. And so we're just like little people. You know what I'm saying? That kind of mean nothing to, you know, big people. Big people that have, you know what I'm saying, or that have the money and kind of like, you know, trying to get us out of this, you know, agriculture business. Pretty soon, I don't even know what's going to happen when, you know what I'm saying, how are we going to be eating beef? You know what I'm saying? When you can't even raise, you know what I'm saying, or have livestock on your property. Um, you know, you can't even, like, uh, basically... Uh, have your neighbor like it used to before we only have a little bit where they can you know um what is it um when they you know roll up the bales of hay you know when with their machinery when they're bailing. Yeah, yeah when they're bailing you know it's it's really scarce it's like we can't even get it anymore around our neighborhood anymore you have to go out really all the way out to ogden you know kind of really far out that way to even get some and then it's so expensive and then, um, as you can see, we're in a just diversified community where there's a lot of Hispanics, and everybody's hungry for, you know what I'm saying, the agriculture, uh, like rodeo, or you know what I'm saying, farm festivals. Um, and we have that. We, we know that potential there. And so, but... They're trying to invade us, like, you know what I'm saying? We get hunted down by realtors at the door, mail, whatever, and it kind of just needs to stop, you know what I'm saying? And I agree with her that's, with the trucking and all that's that. That's your two minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. you for extra Would time. you step back, please? Mm -hmm.
Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? <clears throat> Come up, state your name for the record into the microphone, and you'll have two minutes. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, my name is Sean Johnson. Um, I'm actually from the property that is uh, landlocking Kevin, so the property just to the east of west of them. Um, and I would encourage a positive recommendation to ch to change to M1 for a couple facts. Um, one to create a continuous zone is this little small little AG2 is in the middle of all this BP zone and M1 zone that just doesn't make sense doesn't make it continuous. Um, secondly is like Kevin mentioned uh, we're currently working with Kevin and the owner of the M1 property to the south um, to create a nice road system. If if we if Kevin doesn't get approved as M1 then that's going to create a double road right next to each other um, because of the buffers and stuff that are required between M1 and AG2, um, and so it's going to it's going to look horrible. Um, and then the third reason is the county is actually already charging taxes as if we are M1 because they feel that is the highest and best use of the property, and so it just makes sense to continue on, uh, stick with the master plan, and change that to M1. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to speak on this item? Okay, seeing no one, I will close the public hearing and bring this back to the commission. Would the applicant and David like to come up? There might be some questions here. Questions for staff? Questions for the applicant. You have a sense of how many? Uh, just answer the questions from the uh, from the community council. How many sense of like how many AG two like districts are still left, or kind of acres are left in the city? Uh, I don't have an exact count on that. There is a few small pockets to the north of this. Most of them are much farther to the west, towards the Magna border. Um, maybe can you speak to, um, I'm just looking at the standards for um, the zone change and the first factor is the whether a proposed map amendment is consistent with the purposes, goals, objectives, and policies of the city as stated through its various adopted planning documents. So can you just talk, and your, your rationale in there says that it's um, uh, the um, Proposed light manufacturing zoning district is not strictly consistent with the future land use designation as stated in the North Point small area plan, but then you make the argument that um, it is, that you believe it is generally consistent with the intent of the North Point small area master plan. So can you just talk me through that rationale? Okay, um, so uh, one of the things that was highlighted in the North Point small area plan was the need for retail and service uses to serve some of the future employees of the area. And again, the rationale being that the light manufacturing district allows single tenant retail and service uses um, which could serve those employees of the area. Whereas the, um, okay, heavy manufacturing isn't allowed in that zone, so it would be similar to the BP in that sense. But um, the BP zone uh, requires a lot of those uses to not happen on a single parcel. They have to be a part of an approved uh, business park. So given the acreage, uh, it wasn't always, it's not always practical that somebody would be developing a big business park campus to provide those kind of uses. So, so we were looking at that as meeting the general intent of the plan that the uses in BP and M1 are very similar, but it would allow some of those retail and single use kind of uh, services. Um, and, and what I, I might just be I've had a cold, so maybe my brain isn't working super well, um, which is a really good chance. But why is BP part of that conversation? I know that it's to the north, right? That's the, but, but how, why does that enter that equation in that conversation? Um, if you look at the, uh, the map included on page five of your staff report, uh -huh. it did show the future of this land being uh, 
an oh, extension of the BP zone. I see. Okay. So and that's, I gotcha. Okay, now that, that makes was, sense. That's Thank how you. it's part of the conversation. Okay, gotcha. So, so your argument is that the the land, the small area plan, future land use map that was that went through the process, the community process to be developed and created, um, saw this as BP, and you're saying your argument there is that the M1 doesn't really doesn't really or is relatively consistent with what the B BP and M1 BP and M1 have a very similar intensity of uses uh, we often say the BP is kind of the M1 zone with nicer landscaping or larger lawn requirements but they, they are very similar in their gotcha. scale and intensity of uses okay great and neither one of the master plans call for this parcel to remain agricultural <laughs> No, no. In the North Point small area plan, it does talk about remaining, uh, trying to keep intact some of the agricultural areas that are farther uh, up north on 2200 West. You get into a pocket, a couple pockets that are more agriculture, and those are much more intact. Thank you for that explanation. That helps a lot. <clears throat> Anyone else? You got him here, you can ask questions. You gonna try it again, Brenda? Well, um, I can comment. I'm not really ready to ask these guys questions, but I can comment. Um, I'm opposed to this because um, I'm convinced by the neighborhood council and the visitors that in the uh, uh, here that um, that we need to have conditional use uh, requirements on this for a change into an M1 zone. Um, I don't know exactly what a BP zone would do, um, BD, whatever, uh, business park would be, but it certainly doesn't sound like light manufacturing to me. So, um, and I'm also concerned that any time we turn any use, any other use besides M1 into M1, we open up a fast channel through the whole in port process, and I do not want to do that. So that's why I'm opposed. Okay. Anyone else? A motion? I'm ready to make a motion. Thanks, Sarah. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment. File PLNPCM 2019-004431 for the properties located at 2064 North, 2200 West, and 2066 North, 2200 West. Proposed zone change from AG2 zoning district to M1 zoning district. That was a positive recommendation. It is a positive. I'll second. Thank you, Matt. Okay, just as a reminder, it's up for a positive recommendation. Brenda? No. Thank you. Carolyn? I agree. Sarah? Yes. Weston? Um, I just want to say that I, uh, my heart goes out to the community members, and I understand the, the loss of community and, and what, your, what your neighborhood looked like and continues to look like and how you envision it. Um, but the explanation for me about the, um, the small area plan that was established through a community and public process, um, I think the justification does adhere to the standards um, that we have to make our decision by. So I say yes. Thank you. And Matt? And I also, I think, you know, more in the loss of these agricultural properties and what they kind of are, but I think it's the proposal here is consistent with both the master plans. And I don't, I give him what he could do uh, to the condition use process and the limited tools that we even have to refine that, that I think, um, I don't think it really changes the impact, but leads probably to a better product and is more consistent with the long-term view of what, what the plan was for the community and those master plans. So I'm a yes. Thank you. One, two, three, four to one. You get a positive recommendation going to the city council. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. 
the Salt Lake City Water Reclamation Facility conditional use for a new sewage treatment plant at approximately 1365 West, 2300 North. David. Okay, a moment here regrouping. Okay, so as you noted, this is a conditional use application for the new Salt Lake City Water Reclamation Facility uh, sewage treatment plant. Um, the property is zoned M1, and a sewage treatment plant is a conditional use in the M1 zone. The site itself is 113 acres in size approximately, and there's numerous buildings on the site all related to the operation of the sewage treatment plant. Uh, the proposal has a five-year construction schedule. So um, the applicant can explain it in, of course, much more technical detail, but basically they're rebuilding the sewage treatment plant on the same site in a phased construction approach. Uh, the site context, um, it's located between I-15 and 215 on kind of the northern edge of the city. There's a little bit of property before you get to the Davis County line. Um, Again, adjacent to uh, refineries to the south, it's zoned M2, uh, Tesoro refinery, refinery Fuel Storage Facility. Um, to the east, there is some uh, land zoned um, EI or AI, uh, EI, which we don't see very often, extractive industries for the quarries and gravel pits. So it's in a, in a in heavy industrial zone, and the plant itself has functioned there since the mid-60s. Um, did mention here's a little bit more in context with the zoning, M1 surrounding except to the south, there's M2. And site plan, I mean, it, it much more makes sense probably in your packet, but large phase construction project. Um, we'll say that on a personal note, we toured the facility a few weeks ago and it was absolutely fascinating to, you know, it's a large industrial operation, but a very necessary thing to keep our society civilized, if you will. It was actually really an intersection of kind of science and engineering, but it was fascinating to kind of see the life cycle of where our waste goes and, you know, make, keeping our environment clean. Um, some of the key considerations we looked at, there's multiple buildings on the site. It doesn't require planned development since all of those structures relate to the primary use of the property, which would be the sewage treatment operation. Uh, looked at compatibility and uh, anticipated impacts. Again, given the neighboring properties, both the zoning and the intense uses, um, there's there'd be no more impactful than what is currently there and many of the uses around this site are a lot more impactful heavy manufacturing refining kind of uses than this facility um, the area itself is is used to heavy trucks and equipment traffic uh, those who are on the field field trip probably saw that with some of the traffic going by um, and the master plan, which is the Northwest Master Plan, does anticipate industrial uses to continue in this area. Um, looking at the zoning ordinance standards, it does meet the standard for conditional uses, as well as the uh, detrimental effects determination uh, found in 21A54. And staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use for the new Salt Lake City Water Reclamation Facility. Any questions for staff right now? I think we'll bring the applicant up. Okay. State your name for the record and you have 10 minutes to explain what you're gonna do out there. Good evening, I'm Laura Briefer. I'm the director of Salt Lake City Public Utilities. We are the water, stormwater, and wastewater provider for Salt Lake City. Um, this is a very important um, generational project for us. Uh, we are required to do a portion of this project due to the fact that we need to meet updated environmental regulatory requirements, um, specifically for the discharge of nutrients. So we're being required by the US EPA and DEQ to 
meet more stringent requirements. Um, our discharge is ultimately ends out in the Great Salt Lake, so we agree that's a good thing. Um, and we also are facing critical infrastructure needs at this facility. It's reached the end of its useful life. Um, it's over 55 years old. Um, it doesn't meet current seismic standards um, and some other standards. And so now's the time for us to plan for the next 50 to 75 years of the life cycle of this function of the city. And I'm here with Jason Brown, who is our chief engineer and also um, charged with managing this very large project. Um, also, another of our engineers, um, Alex yeah, Alex Christensen is here, and our public engagement team. We've, we've been doing a lot of public outreach and engagement with respect to this project as well. Um, Jason has a few things he would like to, to show you, if that's okay, but thanks for your time tonight. Go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm Jason Brown, the chief engineer. I've been with the public utilities for about 13 years now. Um, this facility has been around 55 years, and as Laura mentioned, it's in need of some upgrades and uh both for regulatory and the the concrete's just starting to fail out there. Um, uh, David did a great job of explaining the the process or the the uh, the land use out there and, and everything there. So I'm going to actually go into the process a little bit and, and let you give you some uh, insight into what actually happens out there. Get my little pointer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll let you know a little bit more than you wanted to. Um, <laughs> Here on the, le on the west side of, the, of our campus is what we have our drying beds. Right now, all of our waste, the, the, the sludge comes out and it gets putting these drying beds and through the, through the summer months, we're able to dry that out, then pack it up and haul it off the site. Um, that is where a lot of the odor comes from, from the uh, this drying process. So one of the first things that we have to do is actually uh, install a dewatering process that will mechanically dewater the, the, the sludge that comes off of there, allow us then to free up all the space on this west side to construct the, uh, the new plant. We, we can't turn off the flow at all anytime ever. So this plant operates 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Uh, it simply can't sh shut down. So the first process of this is to free up the space to construct the new facility. Um, there's four major components uh, to the, the process. Uh, I can't quite see this very well. The me mechanical dewatering, that I, like I spoke about, it's the first phase of that. It's a critical piece of this process to be able to get, to free up those drying beds. The second part is the, the BNR, the biological nutrient removal. It, it comes out of the liquid train. We remove the nitrogen and phosphorus out of the, the, the liquid stream and then the second part of the, or the third part of this is the solids handling, which is that dewatering also, and then the administration and maintenance buildings that will be coming along. So talking about each of the, each of the little pieces, in the, the south portion of this will be, the south portion of our campus is where the de uh, mechanical dewatering building will be constructed. We are currently actually doing uh, temporary dewatering to be able to free up those drying beds sooner so that we can complete our construction by the regulatory requirement of uh, 2025. The, the BNR, the biological nutrient, nutrient removal, is the key to the whole process. This is both a chemical and a biological process in which um, we recirculate some of the bugs that are in there and they break down the, the nutrients that are in the, the stream and break it down into something that is inert and that can be discharged back into the environment. We have selected a process, I think this is worth noting, um, AECOM is our consultant on this. They are actually the inventor of the, the West Bank method, of this process to actually uh, treat the, the sewage. It's a process that's really good for our environment, it's good for our climate. Um, it, it is all these, th these factors come into play here and we have the, the company or the firm that invented this process on our, on our team to help us deliver this. Um, the solids handling. This is where you, you separate out the, the solids from the liquids. You send the liquids down the liquid streams. The solids then have to be processed because that's where all the, a lot of the nutrients are at. There's a process in, in here that we uh, break it down into pieces that are stabilized that can be uh, land applications. Uh, Kennecott for a long time was using it on top of their, their pile out there to help the grass grow and different things. We're also looking into uh, being able to land up, apply it to different farmlands or 
uh, different things like that. So we're trying to find a, a buyer to use that. Um, we're in the process of that right now. Um, this last slide is kind of gives you an overview. Might be a little hard to see on the on here, but it's an animation of the different processes and what it's going to look like as construction uh, progresses throughout the next five years. So the first step, as I mentioned, is the dewatering building, which will happen on the south side here. The, currently, there's nothing right. There's nothing there. It's just a parking lot. So we'll be taking that out and constructing the building. It shows the administration building being constructed second, but we're uh, debating on that one and letting that one slide a little bit longer into the future. We have the primary, the headworks is where everything comes together. The three sewer, the sewer mains that we have coming throughout the city come together. They go into there, into the headworks, starts the first process of filtration and separating the solids from the liquids. Uh, the next phase of that is where you see these three, or sorry, these four uh, clarifiers. That's where we, again, start settling out some of the solids from the liquids. The next rectangular box there you see is the BNR, the biological nutrient re removal. Um, this is a, a, a incredible process that works 24-7, requires very little energy, and it's a great process. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit different than the process we're currently using, so we're having to actually train our operators to be able to use this process, which is uh, exactly what we want to do to get them engaged and understand what we need to do uh, throughout the whole year because the, as the climate changes, the warmer temperatures and, and the hotter temperatures affect the chemical and biological process. Um, at the, at the nor far north end, there's the uh, final clarifiers that help purify the water to get it to its clearest uh, stage. And at this point, we're dealing with just water. It might have some, uh, um, some other uh, biological agents in there, so it goes through a disinfection process and then finally gets discharged into the city drain that's there to the west or east of the property, which eventually makes it out to the Great Salt Lake. And then after that, the final phase is decommissioning all the other, the, the pieces of the old facility that we don't need anymore. And so that eventually we'll have a very clean site that may end up being ready for the next process of the, uh, or the next phase of this process, which would happen in uh, 2060 or so. So that's the last of my presentation. Questions? Are you planning on having a visitor center that's appropriate for children? Yes, absolutely. Um, on the, located on the north of this, and you can kind of see it here. Um, let me get my mouse back here. Up in this area and the admin building, that'll be a public accessible. Uh, right now, much of the wetlands that are to the north of that are not accessible, and that happened because of the Olympics. Uh, it was a security issue, so we had to fence all that property off so nobody has access to it anymore. Um, we plan on bringing that back into the public view and public uh, uh, accessible. Do you have parking for school buses? Yep, <laughs> absolutely. We, we love the children, you know, the, the boys especially like to be out here uh, for some reason, right? Um, you can imagine. Um, boys just like to get dirty. Yeah. And it, uh, they like to talk about sewage, too. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody did not make it to the, the tour, please let us know and we can make arrangements to get out there to, to do a tour. Thank you. Anybody else? Seeing no questions right now, I'll have you step back. Thank you. We'll open the public hearing on this item. <coughs> Is there anyone from the community council that wishes to speak? The item was sent to the community council. They uh, didn't invite staff or the applicant to present at one of their meetings. They posted information on their Facebook page and they had not submitted any formal comments no response. today. response, okay. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Bring this back up. Questions for David or the applicant? Um, how about a motion? I'll make a motion. Thanks, Weston. I'm also very surprised that we've gotten this far without a poop joke. 
I will say that. <laughs> Until been, now. I've been working very hard, just for the record. I can see Matt I've sitting been, his, For the record, hard. the two men are and the, the ones I'm not that are going motions, to... the reason I couldn't come up with one. I almost had a question about your crappy old building, but I thought that was maybe a little too far. Oh, well. But there we are. Uh, based on the findings and information listed in the staff report and the testimony and plans presented, I move that the Planning Commission approve the requested conditional use application PLN PCM 2019-00526, conditional use for a new Salt Lake City water reclamation facility sewage treatment plant to be located at 1365 West, 2300 North, subject to conditions one and two listed in the staff report. And a second. Number two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You got it in. Oh. <laughs> you guys must live with this all the time. This is going to be a state like... of the art plan. It'll be number one in the number two business. <laughs> oh, no, no. Okay. Uh, On that note. Job here's the job. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow we have to get through a vote here. There's Brenda. <laughs> Uh, I'm strongly in support of uh, up upgrading this facility, and I'm very pleased to see that some of the newest technology is being uh, adjusted here, so applied here. So, uh, yes. Thank you. Carolyn. Agree. Sarah. Yes. Weston. Yes. And Matt. Yes. And no joke to go with it, huh? I, I made mine. I got one. You, made, in. you got yours in? I feel okay. okay. Um, the motion passes. You got your conditional use. Okay. Thanks for your hard work. <laughs> Everyone appreciates it. And if you don't it. have time for a tour, I do have probably 100 photos I took during our tour. I can upload some of those to, to Dropbox. And again, just it's, it's fascinating to see the amount of infrastructure there and how intricate what it, it has is. To so. do. Nice. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have any other business. Just a, Paul? a final reminder that the first meeting in September, we do uh, elections for chair, vice chair. So they're supposed to be putting out their campaign signs and stuff right now? Right. That's right. I want a button. A copy of this. Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you. Alex. Yeah.